Hello, and yes, now. Okay, uh, it's time to, to start the, the third session of the talks of today. But before this, um, there is an important announcement for the, from the organization. And is that uh, even though you might have already registered online for the conference dinner, we still need to double check this and, you, and it's important that you go at some point to the, re the reception desk on the entrance and sign in with a paper, okay, to sign uh, if you want to go to the conference dinner on Wednesday, okay? So before Wednesday, please, everybody should uh, sign the paper to go to the conference dinner. Okay, and having said this, important information, um, the next uh, speaker uh, will be Gunther Rem from the Helmholtz uh, Center in Berlin. Gunther studied uh, at the Erlangen University as an electronic engineer and completed his, P his PhD on imaging with terahertz radiation in 2002. Then he started to work in Diamond, where he contributed to the design, installation, and commissioning of the facility as a head of the diagnostics group. Then in 2020, he moved to the Berlin, and where he's now the responsible for the diagnostics and feedbacks in the accelerator of the Helmholtz Center in Berlin. So welcome, Gunther. Today he will speak us about the review of BPM drifts, effects, and compensation scheme. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for this kind introduction, Ubaldo, and thank you to the organizing committee for inviting me to give this talk here today. Um, um, I'm going to give a talk about compensation schemes to remove drift from beam position monitors, a field which has seen quite some active research in recent years, and I'm going to show some of that to you. So a quick overview. Um, I'll start with a brief introduction into beam position management just to get everyone on the same uh, page and also to the um, source of drift in processing channels. Um, then I'm going to spend a lot of time on the various methods for drift compensation. And finally, I'll summarize and try to give a, a bit of a comparison of the different methods on offer. Um, before I start, I want to acknowledge the lots of help which I got from many people around um, the globe. I've listed them all here. Um, maybe I should uh, specifically thank uh, Gui Mai Wang, who has provided me with, with um, her talk on stability, which is going to be on Wednesday, and also uh, other groups who've provided me with uh, previews of their papers, of which I've used some uh, in this presentation. Now let's begin with what do we really do with beam position management. To many, to measurement. To many that will be um, common knowledge. To some, it's, it's maybe a reminder. So. Um, when we have our beam somewhere in the center of a beam pipe, we want to measure the position of it and we want to measure it in passing. So we don't want to intercept the beam, so we use capacitive pickups, which I've marked here, and those pick up the electric field of the passing beam, which is bunched in our case, and these signals are then compared and put into uh, a difference over some equation, and with that, Sorry, my screen is dropping out. With that, we, we get um, a, a calculation of where the beam position is. Um, this works as well for the upright position, uh, upright uh, geometry, as well for the, what am I called, the diagonal geometry, where it's a teeny bit more involved, but in essence, it's always top buttons minus bottom buttons. Right. Um, the screen is not working, I'm afraid. Yeah, sorry, the screen down there is not working. So, um, so we also have to remind, uh, remember that um, our signals are repetitive pulses, which can be very short, certainly below a nanosecond. Uh, we have high intensities. We will get many tens of volts um, out of these with uh, synchrotrons. And we have huge intensity differences over the operation, which can be a factor more than 10,000 or 80 dBs. In modern light sources, specifically, we demand high precision. So with a scale factor of um, 10 millimeters and maybe a precision demand of knowing it better than 100 nanometers, we can figure out that we basically need to know our individual channels to better than 20 ppm, which if you convert it into dB, 
is a fascinatingly 0.00017 dB. So to that precision, we must be capable of measuring the powers or amplitudes in these four channels. So that's the challenge of beam position management. So there's a different view or just a different view on it is, is what I would call the communications engineer view of it. Um, as a communications engineer, I could say I see a carrier here and a carrier in this specific case is a, a comb of pulses and on that I'm putting a modulation and that modulation is the beam position and this modulation is differential on the top and bottom or left and right plates. So we're trying to find this small differential signal on top of the common signal. There's another common signal which is present in all four and that's obviously the, uh, the bunch pattern because not all the bunches are going to be the same charge. So we're trying to find the small differential signal and ignore the common part. That's again from a different view the challenge. So how is this done? Um, here's a small evolution of, of the processing channels. The top one is maybe the traditional approach which is an uh, analog receiver. You might say a little bit like a radio receiver which tries to receive one channel. So we have a pre-filtering, a bit of amplification, then a mixer which translates the frequencies from the incoming signal frequency down to intermediate frequency where we filter again, amplify again, mix down to baseband and there in baseband we filter down and finally digitize the data because we want the data in a computer network. We have lots of elements in there. Then there was a first generation of digital receivers which basically took away that last mixer and did that with a faster analog digital converter. So we've got already a reduced number of components and also we can change the algorithm in that digital signal processor and in this way get some reconfigurability. So we might now choose between just orbit data, slow orbit data and maybe faster data like turn by turn data which wasn't possible with the first generation. And finally now we move to a second generation where again we took away one more mixer and did that now with a, a sampler which is often operated as an undersampling analog to digital converter. It does in some way mixing and digitization in one step. We've got a, a, a strongly reduced number of components and we have more flexibility but also more complexity by doing the digital signal processing nowadays in an FPGA in a field programmable gate array. So the last one which is basically all the concepts I'm going to show today uses all this second generation approach which clearly has fewer components and fewer components means less components which can drift away. I'm going to say a little bit about this process of drifting. What is drift? Um, I'm not sure there is a, a precise definition of drift but when you look it up in, in, in encyclopedias you find something like um, that noise is not just the white noise which we know from higher frequencies where white noise means white because it's of constant power spectral density but towards lower frequencies it starts to raise in power spectral density. How precisely it raises that's a question of investigation and will be different from system to system. I've given three examples here. It may raise one over F squared so that means that for every decade you go down, it raises one decade in, in uh, power. It may raise only one over F in which case you need two decades for it to increase or it might raise even as a mixture of the two which is depicted by the yellow line here where it changes first to, to one and then to the other one. Precisely how this um, raise at low frequencies happens needs to be investigated on this specific system but it is in some way uh, this change in power spectral density to very low frequencies, we're talking one over hour, one over day, one over week here, which in the end leads to the increased motion towards lower and lower frequencies and that we want to reduce. Uh, we can understand this as being caused by um, external influences like temperature changes, humidity changes, pressure changes, you name it, it can influence electronic components. Um, to get to these um, power spectral density plots with experimental data, I just want to mention it's important that you don't decimate your data because if you do, you get aliases and you can't do this analysis anymore. So just here a few examples and there are many more of electronic drift, of drift in electronic components. 
Um, I've plotted here just for example a mixer which changes several dBs over a temperature range in terms of, of gain of transmission. Yeah. Um, an ADC converter which changes 110 ppm for every degree you change it. Um, an MMIC amplifier, a highly integrated amplifier again which changes maybe a, a 1 dB over a large temperature range but still amounts to uh, hundreds of a dB for every degree. Um, a typical surface acoustic wave filter as used to pre filter which again changes um, even in a in an unfortunate way at different frequencies in, in different ways we're going to see that again later or here uh, a precision attenuator. All these components change with temperature and I've just picked temperature for one example here. So we see all these um, must be reduced or avoided or we must find a process how to figure out what's going on. Then there is another thing which came uh, to our mind just a few years ago and those are the cables. So far we've talked about the processing channel as this electronic part in our box of beam position monitor electronics and we have seen there were the most obvious components which we suspected of drift. But more recently we fi uh, the, the community figured out that also the long cables which we use to connect the button pickups with the electronics can drift. Um, out of the many examples I've picked this one here from spring 8 which I think most clearly illustrates it. Um, in, in this paper which is referred to at the bottom um, they took beam position managers from three buttons each. So if you have four buttons you've got uh, in some way more information than you need. You can already calculate the position from three buttons each and then of course you can add four different combinations of three buttons. And those were computed and then compared with each other and they labeled this the balancing error. And this balancing error is depicted here in blue and on a good BPM, on a stable BPM it remains low all the time. On a different BPM the balancing error goes up and down and up and down over the matter of a few days. And we see here because they've got a different sensor, they've got a, a, a humidity sensor and the humidity in the tunnel does the same motion. Now this is just coincidence but here I think causality is quite clear. It's unthinkable that the change in beam position management measurement changed the humidity. It must be the other way around. The change in humidity changed the beam position measurement. Um, so all in all and there were further investigations which, which um, drew the, this connection closer by which they took some of those cables of that monitor which showed this behavior and put it through a, a time domain uh, response and saw that where the cable was irradiated by the beam and that's something which happens in our accelerators very frequently there was some damage, some modification to the cable and over a few measurements uh, with months in between those changes became visible on the time domain response. And again when they took it out and make these changes deliberate they could see that by changing the relative humidity between 24 and 70 percent relative humidity they could observe this change of a few percent to the uh, reflection coefficient in that cable. Um, so all in all we can conclude that we need to include cables in our stabilization just as well. So that certainly has an impact on how we evaluate the drift performance. In the past it may have been sufficient to take a lab source put it through a splitter, connect it with high quality cables to the BPM electronics and record for a long time and you would get an adequate measurement. This was easily done, you have a controlled source, constant power all the time, go up and down, you can do whatever you want. Maybe you have a bit more issues that you're just producing the, the f or trying to reproduce the fill pattern, you can't produce the sharp spikes as they were originally and certainly you did not evaluate the cables. Nowadays um, a test of drift is a slightly bit more involved you better start off with a pickup from the electron beam where maybe you sum the four signals then you have your summed signal and split it again to get reasonably equal signals. You connect that in the tunnel to your front end then you have your cables which we now question as well going to your BPM electronics and then you evaluate that whole set. Now I should just point out that even if we do it like that we must remind ourselves that um, we really trust that part here, especially we trust this splitter here to be perfect. We have to really ask ourselves how valid that assumption can be when we're coming to the level of a few ppm. 
and we have at the moment no way to determine. So what we're really evaluating is the whole system and we're assuming that the contribution from any changes in the splitter is reasonably small and that all the errors which we still observe happen in the BPM system. Um, maybe some more careful thing in the future can, can involve this. So, two ideas of drift compensation I will give some examples on today just to introduce them here. The one is called switching and many people will know about it. It's been around for a few years. And the other one is called pilot toning. That's the more recent candidate. More recent maybe with success. Um, actually the idea has been around before the, the switching uh, with four channels started. So the switching idea follows the idea that you have your four processing chains for your various signals and you have your worry that they might drift between each other. So what you do is you say okay one moment you feed the signal straight through and then a moment later you change the configuration on your crossbar switch and you feed the signals differently through the channels. So in this case you might feed the signal coming in on channel D through channel 1 while previously it was going through channel 4. And you rotate through this switch and of course you unrotate, you unswap it inside the FPGA. So there you put things back into order. And by making this continuous rotation or uh, exchange of channels you're taking out any variation between the channels. So you're literally looking at the average of the different channel performance. It works very efficiently. However, it generates um, small moments of no knowledge and those are the moments where you're switching. While you're switching you get invalid readings. So you must blank out those moments and this will generate uh, disturbances in your spectrum. The other approach says okay I've got the same thing but maybe I could add an additional signal. So I have my four channels going straight through and if only I could add an additional signal to that from a additional source, let's call it a pilot tone source, this one down here and that one I've split into equal parts and add to my signal and if they follow in spectral closeness through the whole processing chain. So I choose a frequency which is close to but not exactly my signal frequency and then of course later on in my FPGA I must not only detect my signal frequency but I must also detect my pilot frequency. And then I can do the, uh, the um, again correction in my FPGA by saying I know now what the gain of my various channels was and I take this out. So these are the two different concepts. Now let's see how it's going to be put into execution and there will be a few more to, to extend. So first one which, which has nothing to do with this but it's I think still worth mentioning. Uh, it's called time multiplex processing, an idea which has been put into practice at DAISY and other places. Um, here the idea is that you could take the four signals and delay them for various amounts of time and then add them together on the same cable and put them through the same processing chain. This avoids the whole messing about with four different chains. You just put them in a row and, and uh, have them in time after each other. Works beautifully as long as you've got the, the time in your signal to do this. So for instance in, in light sources with two nanosecond bunch spacing um, it becomes difficult to line up these bunches behind each other and certainly if you later have to think about the digitizer to, to distinct these individual bunches it becomes really complicated. So uh, to my knowledge this has only been in use in a few linear machines. Uh, Daisy Flash it was in use in past at HERA with 48 nanosecond bunch spacing um, but I'm not aware that it's in use nowadays. Um, I'll continue with uh, an example from the ESRF EBS. Um, they've got um, a system where they used um, straightforward four channel receivers and they employ, employed them without any additional stabilization of the schemes I showed before. Instead they bolted together in an industrial development the whole board with all these many screws which you see here all these little silver things are screws. They're all bolted to a big heat sink so the whole board is held at common temperature as far as mechanically possible. 
and that works actually really quite well. And they've demonstrated that by testing their whole lot of additional uh, 128 BPMs. They installed them, fed them with split signals from BPMs, and came up with this conclusion here that over six hours, those sets drift about 200 nanometers apart. Um, so they've got a large set and looked at deviation between those sets. Um, I find this quite fascinating. Um, it proves that even doing nothing, you might get a working solution. One drawback which the solution has, it still has a rather large temperature coefficient. So for every degree which the temperature changes, they are observing about two microns of change on the position. So they still have to keep everything at a reasonable constant temperature. Um, a similar approach was taken at NSLS2 in their original four channel receiver. This was an in house development and they also put in actually the idea of a pilot tone which we see here the pilot tone injector for it. In the end they used the pilot tone injection only for commissioning so to feed in signals before there was beam signal and to that end it was quite useful but it's never been used uh, in online correction so in the terms of uh, gain adjustments during during running. Um, instead they put the BPMs into highly temperature controlled racks where inside the rack there's an active temperature controller and keeps the whole rack temperature within 0.1 degree RMS or 1 degree peak to peak. And that again with that stabilization produced a uh, good enough performance. But why have they not used the pilot tone? Well we'll come back to that in a moment. In the meantime they did some experiments and said well maybe we could improve our system if if the pilot tone doesn't work maybe we'll add some switching in the front. And they produced this little device here where you can see the switch. It's just a little black device in the center and it switches just between two channels. And those channels are diagonal channels and that's good enough. And when they switch between channels and then later do the the unwrapping they show here how their previous uncertainty which was maybe 130 nanome nanometers RMS shrinks down to a mere 40 nanometers or 130 nanometers peak to peak. Um, that's an excellent improvement. Unfortunately it's only so far been presented in, in these experiments and they're now looking at rolling this out to, to the larger scale. But it really has proven that uh, over long periods of time, here is again the comparison of the uh, original BPM and in blue with the switching, they've got this huge improvement uh, of stability. Unfortunately the numbers are not um, given in a way that we can compare this with, with uh, other measurements because for instance we're missing the scale factor which has been in use. Now the NSLS2 system has further been investigated at ALS who worked together with them. They took the existing front end and looked into detail and found out that the reason for the pilot toning not working is in the filters in use. So here we see this graph again which I showed before. They've taken the, the, the whole front end and measured through it with a network analyzer and then drove it at various frequencies uh, about 10 degrees apart and then normalized it to one temperature. So the red one is the normalized one which was at 32 degrees and then the different ones show the deviations and we can see that over this small range of frequencies this is 497 megahertz this is 502 megahertz so exactly the range where we make our measurements we get this variation of percents up and percents down and if you're trying to now use a pilot tone you have the issue that wherever you choose it's not giving you good enough information for the frequency of the signal. So let's say your signal frequency was the green line but using a pilot tone at the red line you're not getting the correct information because it's behaving differently at that frequency. Even if you choose two frequencies and interpolate between it, it's not giving you the right information to the level we need. So they figured out that if they exchange these surface acoustic wave filters with ceramic filters, they have a much better behavior. So they have a nice and flat behavior and it was that essential information, that change to the front end which led to the successful application of the pilot toning scheme. Uh, so ALS changed the front end. ALS created a, a, a pilot tone injection. This is their pilot tone distribution board. And also um, they made their own injection 
block, which you can see here, is literally built from connectorized mini circuits components. When I first saw this, I thought, ooh, that is an odd choice, but later on, I figured out maybe it's actually a smart choice because this is a very clean solution. Yeah, it, it's, uh, it doesn't require any symmetrical arrangement on a PCB. It's a very clean way of injecting the pilot tone. And then, of course, they also modified the FPGA code. They now have three digital down converters for channel, per channel, so they can receive the lower pilot tone, the higher pilot tone, and uh, the signal channel and use that to compute um, a calibrated position. And with that, they get amazingly good results. So on the top plot here, you can see four days of position. There's a period here where the pilot tone was deliberately switched off. But over those four days, the margins are plus minus 100 nanometers. So over those four days, the position me measurements stay within plus minus 100 nanometers. That's excellent. Where the pilot tone is off, it moves away many microns. That's to be expected as well. And they also uh, were the only ones who managed to produce a, a good power spectral density plot. And that shows that, in fact, the benefits of the pilot tone are not just at lowest frequencies, at fractions of a hertz, but also they go up to about a kilohertz. There are benefits from the pilot tone. So as soon as the switch on the pilot tone, you drop down from the blue power spectral density to the red power spectral density. And you can see it's all nice and clean here, and that's really useful. So I can only suggest to everyone who does these investigations to go and look at these power spectral density plots. Um, another group working on that is the uh, group at Electra. They also built an upgrade BPM for, for the Electra upgrade. Um, they've moved from a concept, which again looks very much like the original one, where maybe the important part is that while um, ALS used these um, connectorized couplers, in uh, in Electra, they're using power splitters, so a slightly different component to add the uh, the signal into it. But again, this front end would sit in the tunnel. It now includes also amplifiers in it, and uh, so it does most of the analog processing. And behind that sits a digitizer uh, in the uh, rack area, which is very common and could also be reused for other purposes. Um, they've gone through uh, an industrialization project where they've moved from this concept to uh, a nicely industrialized board, which you may see out there uh, on, on some of the commercial outputs. And uh, by now, they're getting quite good results with that. So again, looking at uh, a period of um, 12 hours, they're staying well within plus minus 100 nanometers. And over a longer period, it's slightly more. Um, I think they're still investigating. They, they found that some parts of this are still, unfortunately, some humidity or other environmental changes. But even if, if there are still visible changes here, um, the, they are still meeting the, the specification very well. And it should be noted that um, the numbers you, you see here, uh, we need to also keep in mind that the scale factor is different at Electra. So these are plotted with twice the scale factor of the different ones with 20 millimeters. So thus, they're obviously twice the size. Um, Diamond is working on uh, a system as well, and you're going to hear more about that in the next talk. Um, I'll say very little about it, but you see, again, uh, a front end with filters and amplification, and maybe also uh, an, an interesting detail which Lawrence is going to talk about the next, uh, also the ability also to inject the pilot tone with a, a passive front end. And again, even while these might be earlier days in terms of development, it's already um, nearly meeting the demands of the Diamond 2 project. I'll also mention uh, the plans of Spring 8, which we have seen uh, during uh, um, recent other, confer uh, other conferences. Um, uh, to my knowledge, this is still plan only, but it's interesting in such a way that there are now four different frequencies of pilot tone injection, which can inject it from the uh, rack electronics towards the buttons. So they have to travel to the buttons and then back. This offers lots of possibilities for measurement, um, but I haven't seen uh, an online demonstration of the uh, calibration capabilities. Then there is Sirius, which have uh, also a switching concept. In their case, it's a two by two switch. And I show here the front end where you can see 
there's a switch component down here that little black thing and again it switches just two channels so very similar to the NSLS2 project. Um all this is integrated. Now it happens that they've integrated even though it's in a separate box that box is currently in the rack area but in the future might be removed or might be moved to the tunnel to stabilize the the cables as well. Their performance is is excellent and what's fascinating there is again they've built all those systems and checked all the systems and found there's actually quite a spread system to system. So this shows uh 20 out of their 200 something systems and the best one you can see here is stable to below 10 nanometers while the worst one they would let pass stays just within 200 picometers. And um the the, dis the distribution of those uh errors is relatively broad and still under investigation what the cause for it is. For us it's just uh, the reminder that it's not good enough to have one system which works you need to test possibly all systems. The final one I'm going to talk about <coughs> is DAISY which are looking at BPMs for Petra 4. That's a special project because it will have very long cable runs <coughs> so for that the control of cables was mandatory. They previously compared piloton and switching and came to conclusion that the switching concept is more to their needs so together uh, with industry they developed this concept of moving the crossbar switch from the rack area towards the tunnel. And the results they get with that are very excellent as well. There's still a small drift component visible, uh, a small slope I should say over the period of of 10 hours or uh, 100 hours but again the specifications 150 and 300 nanometers peak to peak are well within the demanded specification. So with that I'm drawing to the close. Um I've given you an overview of this whole mind map of of system which I'm just showing here again. We maybe came <coughs> to the conclusion that um maybe to my personal desire the pilot tone injected uh, inside uh, the tunnel is is not so useful but maybe it is. Uh, I think there's more towards the distributed pilot tone and I've shown you examples from many different systems around the world covering this area. I've deliberately not shown any examples of those uh, lots populated 4 by 4 switching ones of all which there are more than I could name nor of the 4 to 1 switching of which there are many but I've given you a, a broad overview. And with that I come to my conclusions. So uh, the inclusion of cables in stabilization is required and demonstrated. Um, results we have seen from both pilot tone and switching well below 1 micrometer drift over 1 week has been demonstrated. Um, in my opinion the pilot tone with two tone injection and passive injection provided the best results so far. Um it's also important to notice that pilot tone is beneficial for monitoring without beam so to to test your system either pre beam or later uh, ongoing in, in in shutdowns. Um a test of the full production is uh, definitely useful to get more reliable assessment. Lesser drift values provide diminishing drift so I I would be careful to say I go for the system which provides 50 nanometers over the system which provides 150 nanometers because in the context of where we're using it there are lots of other uh, drift reasons like the physical position of button blocks or, or the floor moving on, on much larger time scales. So finally the only solution out is to add additional diverse monitors like temperature monitors, humidity monitors, floor motion monitors uh in operation so that we better understand what's going on. And with that I thank you for your attention and I'm open to any questions. Thank you very much Gunther for this very nice review. Um are there questions in the room? I don't see anything. Some questions. Um uh, here. In the world of uh, longitudinal diagnostics there are also drift issues and there I think the favoured solution is phase stabilised optical fibres so I'm wondering if this has also been an approach with uh, BPM electronics to transfer over fibre rather than uh, cables as you suggest. Um, not that I'm aware of. There are some thoughts of having optical pickups but I think they're very early on and it's still some time to wait.
before we get to that point. And lacking those, we'd have to convert the signals from electrical to optical, then transfer to the fiber, and then convert back. And I would be worried about these double conversions and, and the uncertainty we may be adding in that. Thanks. Thank you. I don't know if there is any more talk, any more uh, questions. Okay, then I don't say anything. Okay, then if not, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you very much, Gunther. And okay, now our, our next speaker will be Lawrence Stan from the Diamond Light Source. Um, Dr. Lawrence is a senior diagnostics engineer at the Diamond. Uh, since one year ago, he was previously in the, working in the RF group for three years. Uh, his research was about the metrology of nonlinear microwave devi devices, but his current work includes the development of the new BPM front end uh, alongside with the other diagnostics um, electronic systems, such as the multi bunch feedback front ends. So today he will uh, be speaking us, uh, talking about the Diamond 2 electron BPM development. Okay, so you have 15 minutes. Thank you for the introduction and thanks to the organizing committee for the opportunity to speak today. Um, so uh, my talk is going to be on our new eBPM system for Diamond 2. Um, it, it follows on very well from uh, Gunther's talk uh, introducing the theory um, and so going to go on to some details of our implementation. So the talk will cover the Diamond 2 upgrade uh, and then uh, the, the requirements put on the new eBPM system from that. And then we'll go over a, an overview and then all of the different components that feed in. Um, and then some system measurements on the existing diamond machine of our prototypes um, and finally a conclusion. So what is Diamond 2? It's an upgrade of diamond light source into a fourth generation synchrotron. Um, this involves replacing the entire machine at diamond, so the LINAC booster and storage ring. <clears throat> um, and this is achieved with a double triple bend acromat cell. So the current systems are double bend acromat, adding a lot more magnets. This is going to give us some more insertion devices. Um, it's, uh, we're still at 500 megahertz uh, RF frequency, increasing the energy, but crucially for us, uh, for diagnostics, reducing the horizontal emittance from 2700 to 160 picometer radians. And this obviously puts uh, new uh, requirements on our fast orbit feedback system to achieve this um, and also then the eBPM system to drive that. So going into those system requirements which are specified in our conceptual design report in 2020, um, really a critical parameter here is increasing the data rate um, up from 10 to 100 kilohertz uh, from our eBPM system to our fast orbit feedback. Um, uh, existing BPM systems are limited to 10 kilohertz, so this necessitates a new system to be developed or at least installed. Uh, for Diamond 2, we need 252 new uh, B eBPMs, around about 180 in Diamond at the moment. Um, we are not replacing the injector BPMs as part of the Diamond 2 upgrade, that will, will follow on afterwards. The main specs here are short term motion, so less than a second. For commissioning at 0.3 milliamps, we want less than 130 nanometers per square root hertz. And for a user beam at 300 milliamps, less than 2 nanometers per square root hertz. Looking at the drift and stability, as per the last talk, um, up to a one week, we have a, a basic requirement of less than one micron peak to peak uh, motion. This is essentially just from our electronics course. Um, Looking at the, the um, state of, of play in 2020, um, the state of the art commercial off the shelf solution using multiplex switching um, for channel compensation, um, because we're going up to 100 kilohertz, we were concerned that we would see harmonics in our data rate um, up there. Um, since then, things have changed, but we were making these design decisions back then. So, um, looking at some, some promising results from pilot zone compensation systems developed. Um, at the time, we decided to pursue an in-house um, solution there. We also had a sufficient technical resource to, to make that decision at the time. Another nice decision for us with Pilot Tone is that it allows the commissioning as touched in the previous talk, so we don't actually have to have a beam yet to check that all of our girders are cabled properly and the infrastructure is in place. So looking at an overview, um, we start off uh, on the left-hand side, we have our control instrumentation area outside the vault with the racks. 
Uh, on the right, we have our um, uh, we have our uh, vault. So we've got the beam running through here with our BPMs. There's three main parts to this. We've got the in blue, we have the BPM signals coming down four channels in from the buttons into an analog front end in the vault at the bottom of the girder. These then run through individual cables into our CIA to be digitized in a micro TCA crate. Uh, we also have our pilot tone system. It's generated by this box up here I'll talk about later. Um, it's generated external to the vault, um, supplied one to each girder. There's two girders per cell. And on the patch panel by the girder, we're going to reuse an analog front end as a distribution amplifier, so a four channel amplifier, which will then feed passive splitters, one to two splitters, along the girder, which then go into our analog front ends. And then finally, in green, we have our control signal, um, which is done over an RS485 serial chain, and that loops through all of our analog front ends. Um, our pilot is locked to our machine frequency through an event receiver card in the micro TCA crate in that same rack. Um, so looking at the, the parts in turn, our button pickups, based on the previous DDBAA, the double double bend acromat cell um, upgrade we did a few years ago at Diamond. This was trialing um, similar to a Diamond 2 deployment, uh, and also based on the ESRF 6 millimeter button. Uh, it's a smaller block aperture of 20 millimeters, and uh, as with Diamond, we split into primary and standard BPMs. Moving on to the analog front end, um, as I've mentioned before, it's uh, four channels, uh, external pilot injection. We've got a, a diagram at the top there. Um, uh, we have the splitter for all four channels based inside the, uh, the analog front end. Uh, we use helical filters as our bandpass filters. Um, over ceramic. These are an order of magnitude cheaper, um, but also more importantly, are tunable um, so we can accommodate for any roll off on our amplifiers and, um, uh, and, any, and the couplers, sorry, uh, during manufacture. Uh, there's a calibration step there. Um, we drive it from an STM 32R microcontroller using the RS485, and we've also developed a very efficient remote firmware update um, to deploy across uh, all of the around 300 units. And they're fed uh, power supply wise from a 12 volt switch mode um, draw redundant supplies in the CIA, um, and then linear regulators on board for uh, hopefully very low ripple, low noise power supply. Um, so, locating them in the vault, the main question here is uh, going to be how close can we get it to the buttons? Because the closer the buttons, the more cables we can compensate, cable length we can compensate, um, and the noise then reduces and drift. Um, but of course, the closer we get to the beam pipe, the more radiation we are exposed to, and this has integrated electronics inside. We've done some experimentation by strapping some of our boards to the beam pipe, and we found that our re real sensitive component of the linear regulators, um, they degrade after about 40 grays of exposure. Um, all other parts are still, have still been working after 170 grays, including the um, processor. So. Uh, so we know what our target's 40 gray. We want to find out when we're going to reach that on Diamond 2. Um, Diamond 2 has about three times the, uh, the, the dose uh, and the losses as, as the Diamond machine. So uh, we've deployed some RADFET radiation sensors um, down the side of the girder, which you can see on the diagram on the right here, the photograph, sorry. Um, we also got one on the beam pipe along with a, a board and a Duffy board, uh, sorry, an analog front end board and also another one on the floor. And the results are in this table here. And we can, and just to say, sorry, these are located downstream of the collimators and injection septum magnets. So that should be our highest dose area on the machine. And we find that around the middle to a lower area, if we take these exposures, three gray, four gray, um, that would equate to 3.3 diamond two years. That's a bit too short for us. Um, by the time we've got useful performance out, we'd have to be swapping them over. Um, but if we go below there, um, we find um, consistently negligible results. Um, so. Um, our decision is as long as we can mount them as close as possible to the floor, and this is the control end with the regulators, they're right at the bottom of the assembly, then, uh, then we're confident that they'll survive um, for us. So then the pilot zone compensation, this is generated outside the vault in our CIA. Um, it's actually a dual redundant system, so we have two of these pilot tone generator boards. This is still a prototype at the moment. Um, so this takes our reference from the EVR, it runs into a dual loop PLL system, um, it has a variable gain amplifier, so we can um, experiment with feed forward uh, compensation for any amplitude tracking. Uh, and another monitor output there for us. It also has the RS485 master on board. 
Um, so to talk about the redundancy and the RF uh, side, um, the outputs of two of these will feed an RF 3DB hybrid which then goes to the two girders. If one of these boards locks up or the PLL breaks uh, in the control system, we can switch over to the other board. We can actually remotely kill the power to the PLL chip, so if that just becomes unresponsive, we can, we can kill its power, and that gives us enough isolation to run with the other system. Um, and with the RS485, rather than just terminate one end of the chain, we go back into the other um, pilot tone generator, and then we can switch control over to the other board too. So it should minimize any hardware changes we have to do at three o'clock in the morning. Um, moving into the micro TCA crate, um, we've got an architecture diagram on the right for you. Um, we've managed to get all of the micro TCA requirements, um, which we're standardizing on for Diamond 2, moving away from VME. Uh, all of the diagnostics requirement for a cell into a single 12 slot crate. This is four EBPM dual FMC carrier cards. Each of our EBPM FMCs are an eight channel, 16 bit, 250 mega samples per second um, board. Um, up to three XBPM um, carrier cards with their ADCs. We're using two MCHs, so carrier hubs which handle the networking and, and data side um, or orchestration. One for PCI Express, which effectively uh, just feeds our EPICS network. Um, and then another one for our dedicated fast or bit feedback uh, gigabit Ethernet uh, network. And then also the event receiver and CPU cards. And for fast interlocks from beam positions, um, we're intending to build a rear transition module um, which can be installed on one or more of the EBPM AMCs. That's to be decided. And moving on to the streams coming out of the ADC. So we're running at 250, 215 mega samples per second, and that can go straight to RAM for development and testing. Uh, but the main use will be down converted with a 70 megahertz intermediate frequency down sampled into several streams. So we have our 4.1 megahertz intermediate um, acquisition stream, a 98 kilohertz fast acquisition stream, uh, which is also used to, for our fast orbit feedback position uh, uh, feed and to our fast archiver, one kilohertz medium acquisition um, as a new archiver source, and our 10 hertz slow rate for our epics feed. Um, all of the, the FA, MA, and SA have an interleaved pilot measurement. Uh, this obviously is used to calculate the X, Y, and do the compensation for some streams. But again, it's also useful for us to do um, development and testing, looking at how the pilot's being affected alongside our main signal. Um, to present some measurements we've done on the Diamond machine, um, what we've got at the moment to test it uh, is we're interested in the long term um, or interesting long term and short term noise measurements. And so uh, we've already done some lab testing, but uh, we, we value more the machine testing with a realistic button connection um, because these are far from 50 ohms, so it's better for us to see how it performs in the field. Uh, so we use a spare button block on the diamond machine, we terminate the other three. Um, and that goes through a one to four, four, measure, one to four way measurement splitter. It's important to see how these are constructed here. They're typically a one, two tiers of cascaded one to two way splitters. And that gives us our ABCD signals into our analog front end in the vault where it should, uh, is going to be for diamond two, and then back to the CIA. And in the CIA, we're using all of the equipment we want for diamond two. There's no lab equipment in there. It's our pilot tone generator and the ADCs we're intending to use. So it's a complete diamond two system. So looking at some of the results, um, this is fast acquisition noise spectra here. Um, it's quite clear to see the benefit of the pilot tone. Uh, so from about one kilohertz below, which happens to agree with the data that Gunther presented before, we see the, the benefit. The X and Y are slightly different. This is due to the ADC arrangement. Um, by rearranging our cables, we can uh, have a better performance with the Y, which is what we'll be doing because we need a tighter emittance there. And there are still some lines to investigate at higher frequencies there. Um, we've got a good mind what some of them are. Um, and the target I'm showing, the dotted line, is our short term spec of two nanometers per root hertz, um, blended towards our longer term of one micron peak to peak over a week, um, using an, a noise fit of, of the data we've had already. Moving on to slow acquisition, um, you can still see the pilot benefit all the way down. Um, these big spikes we see here are actually the, term by, uh, the um, top up and its harmonics. Um, there's a trade-off between signal to noise um, and uh, linearity um, when we select the attenuation in our front end. We need very, very linear performance from our amplifiers, much more than communication normally cares. Um, and so we're getting that balance right at the moment. Um, those peaks will, will uh, decrease um, with the, the beam current dependence if we change that balance. 
Um, and then the line we have at half a hertz is an interesting one. It was due to a flashing status LED on our circuit board. That's how sensitive our detection is and on our processing is there. So that's now been fixed and it's a constant green status LED. And then the actual useful output XY data, looking at the drift and stability over time, so it's time domain data now. Um, you can see the difference in the X and the Y I showed before, and the fact we felt it got a thicker line on the Y at the moment and a thinner line on the X. But the bigger problem here is is the drift on our X. Um, we can see we're we're just going over our requirements, so so this isn't good. And the Y performance is much better. What could be causing this? Well. Looking here at the A, B, C, D buttons, so the separate button uh, signals, if we plot a local humidity sensor in the vault against it, we can see a very strong correlation in our C button, a strong negative correlation in our D button. Um, what could this be? Well, remember the picture of the splitter from earlier. Um, the C and the D uh, share a two way splitter on the second sort of tier. Um, and if there's a humidity sensitive imbalance on that splitter, more so than the others, um, then that could explain what we're seeing here. Um, so we've, we've just commissioned a new test bench um, which is very stable for doing more long term drift and humidity uh, measurements to investigate this. So to conclude, uh, a new EPPM for Diamond is underway, it's in development, um, we're happy with the prototype performance so far, we've still got quite a few avenues to investigate um, and Im improve uh, which should hopefully get us uh, within our specification. Um, our next steps are improve, improving the long term stability, focusing on, on, the, on that area, and potentially investigating software compensation methods for drift that we can apply after we've optimized our hardware. Um, so, just to, to finish, thanks to my co authors and special thanks to Dr. Gunther Rehm um, for initial development work whilst at Diamond. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Lawrence, for this talk. Um, is there time for questions now? I have some time, so. Over there. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm curious to know about your new test bench uh, for the long term stability. You are just changing the splitter or doing something different? So our new test bench, the, the main requirement for it was uh, our previous test bench was designed for testing an entire cell's worth for communication testing and for doing the initial testing um, of things like the pilot tone generator looking at frequency performance. Um, therefore the cabling and the physical structure of the test bench was not really rigorous or stable enough for doing uh, hour, day, week long measurements. Um, if you walked up close to it and coughed near it, or walked around the lab, uh, you could see that on the data. So really our new test bench is focused on mechanical stability, upgrading the cables to what we will be using in the vault, uh, really anchoring all the cables down so we can do a very qualitative as assessment of the noise just from our analog front end. Uh, and for the splitter? So the splitter, we've tried a few splitters. Um, it's an in interesting question. Um, so we, we again, the result I presented there, we, we need to do some more investigation there. Um, just to, to go on the side slightly, um, Gunther Rehm presented about this external pilot tone injector, which, which we're about to, to test on the machine. Um, that's, uh, the nice thing about that is that this humidity variation we saw, uh, it could be the measurement splitter. The only other place it can come from is the pilot tone splitter. So if we take the pilot tone splitter, we put those couplers close to the buttons, we put them on a separate small PCB that we can really well um, get good temperature stability on there and we can experiment with different ways of making that very stable, then that, that's a very promising way of, of uh, furthering that investigation. Thank you. Are there any more questions? Otherwise, I, ha I have one because short. Uh, have you, you have gone, uh, the Gunter previously told us that there are two methods of our compensation, the switching and the piloton. Have you tried the switching or have you discarded it already? We and haven't why? tried the switching yet, uh, but we haven't discounted it. So it's uh, something to look at. Okay, Thanks. thank you. Okay, if there are no more questions, then let's take the speaker again and move to the next speaker. The next speaker is Hideki Aoyagi from Spring 8. 
Hideki uh, did his PhD in Nagoya University and then he moved to do a, a postdoc in Slack in 93, 94. Uh, and then since then he has been a research at the Japan Synchrotron Radiation Research Institute uh, since 1995. And um, since the beginning he has been engaged in the R&D operation and maintenance of the X-ray BPMs in the photon beam lines. Uh, previously in DIPAC uh, 2011 he already did a talk about the diamond based electron beam halo monitor with RF fingers for a spring gate. But today he will talk about the pulse-by-pulse -pulse photon beam position measurements at the spring aid using an undulator beam line. So please, Hideki, you're going to start. You have 15 minutes. I'm talking about, <laughs> I'm talking about pulse by pulse photon beam position measurement at the spring aid undulator beam line. I'm Hideki Aoyagi of uh, spring aid. Of this work. Uh, the, the other one? The batteries. Yes, that's so you have to. This, this here, 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 and then oh. the pointer is here. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, here's the outline. <coughs> I mentioned about limit of conventional XBPM and prototype of pulse by pulse XBPM. <coughs> and we modified the structure of detecting elements. And I will show you comparison of wave forms. And later, after that, uh, I will talk about evalu evaluation test. There are three items. <coughs> uh, limitation of conventional XBPM. <coughs> conventional XBPM. Uh, have been used for a long time all over the world. However, they are not possible to observe pulse by pulse beam fluctuation. Uh, this figure is conventional XBPMs. And position is cal calculated from four detection elements. This is a waveform of current signal measured by conventional XBPM. <coughs> uh, that cannot be distinguished due to pile up. Uh, 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 filling pattern is two or three bunches mode. And bunch separation is uh, 24 nanoseconds. <coughs> Sorry. I cannot back. <laughs> yeah. Strange. <coughs> okay. <coughs> For time resolved experiment. Pulse by pulse measurement of photon beam is highly desired. <clears throat> Design policy, there are two key words, impedance mismatch, impedance matching, and small floating capacitance. <clears throat> so, 
left side is micro thread line uh, is uh, mounted on vacuum feed through flange and right side and photo cathode is deposited on diamond heat sink. Next. Uh, this is a structure of photon uh, mulch <coughs> pulse mode XBPM. The prototype has been operating at the bending beam line for over three years without any troubles. We, uh, our goal is to perform at an insert, insertion device beam line which is irradiated by intense radiation power. The actual irradiation power density at IDBM is uh, up to 25 watt per square milli radian. Therefore, the mounting method of detection element was modified. Uh, there are two modifications. Double the size from 8 to 16 millimeter and number to clamp on the both side of the diamond heat sinks using a wedge-shaped copper plug instead of just spring plate. Uh, waveform comparison between prototype and modified type. In prototype, uh, tested at bending beam line, and right side, hand side mo modified type tested at tested at insertion device. Uh, there is no uh, noticeable change in waveform, which is suggesting that basic performance are maintained. And the current signal is inc was increased from eight to three hundred millivolts per uh, fifty ohm. Uh, or an increase in current signal is directly beneficial for resolution. No, now I go to the evaluation test. There are uh, three items, position sensitivity, resolution, and observation during beam injection. <coughs> position sensitivity. To know the sensitivity of a pulse mode XBPM, it is necessary to know a real motion of photon beam. But presently, we do not have that means. Therefore, we compared pulse mode XBPM data with the perturbation amplitude estimated from a single pass BPM. Stationary perturbation was excited by RF knockout by beam, shaper, beam shaker. And perturbation frequency is set to match tune. And the photon, photon beam position amplitude at, at pulse mode XBPM can be calculated by uh, single pass BPM data. Uh, this is a measurement data of pulse mode XBPM. This is a uh, connecting diagram. Uh, this shows a vibration when the nominal kick power is uh, uh, changed. This is a vertical. 
this is a measurement data, and uh, nominal kick power was defined when the amplitude of 0.1 millimeter observed by uh, single pass BPM. Uh, this is the results. <coughs> Horizontal axis is the esti estimated amplitude from s s single pass BPM, this and this. And vertical axis is the measured amplitude by uh, pulse mode XBPM. Sufficient linearity or position sensitivity enough for politi uh, practical use was confirmed in both horizontal and vertical directions. Uh, the next item is uh, resol resolution. <coughs> uh, this is an experimental set of filling pattern is uh, machine study special mode. The bunch current is varied from 0.5 to 5 milliamp per bunch. Uh, and this is a screenshot of oscilloscope. And right hand is overlay of the waveforms of each current. And this is result. The, this, fi this figure shows fluctuation in difference over summation from the four detection element of pulse mode X BPM, horizontal direction and vertical direction, this. In this the figure, standard deviation of uh, difference over summation multiplied by correction factor and when the bunch current is high, a resolution of 10 micron was achieved. Even at bunch current, the resolution of 10 micron can be achieved by optimizing the range of the oscilloscope. Uh, this is the next item observation of an oscillation during injection. Uh, Top-up injection is regularly performed during user time. We attempt to observe pulse-by-pulse -pulse behavior when the beam is injected. Uh, we, the uh, single isolated bunch is tracked by using th this setup. And result is uh, this. Uh, turn number is zero at this uh, uh, time uh, timing. Beam is injected. Uh, difference behavior were observed in horizontal and vertical. Next slide. Uh, this is the second measurement of observation of an, of, during injection. In this case, 203 bunches were tracked. Vertical axis is difference over summation, which is corresponds to transverse position. And horizontal scale is 400 microsecond per division, 4 microsecond per division, and 40 nanosecond per division. And right hand side is vertical. Vert vert <laughs> Yeah, and 
each pulse with band separation of 24 nanoseconds is clearly observed. So the, this kind of oscillation diminish in several hundreds of microseconds. So this oscillation do not affect on user, experiment, user experiments. At any rate, for the first time, we succeeded in pulse-by-pulse -pulse measurement of photon beam at insertion device beam line. So, summary. We modified the detection element for further heat resistance. And we made evaluation test at insertion device beam line. We confirmed durability and position sensitivity and resolution and observation during injection. For our next step, optimization of operating condition and construction of signal processing is necessary for user uh, operation. Thank you. Sorry about, <laughs> sorry about my <laughs> broken news. Thank you very much, Ideki, for this uh, talk, and congratulations for the results, very good results. Are there questions in the room? Okay, in case not, I have uh, one. Um, the the, the XVPMs uh, we have seen at ALBA and also in other light sources like Diamond, there is a dependence on the bias voltage of the XVPMs. Do you have uh, seen this bias voltage dependence? Uh, uh, big difference. This measurement, all measurement were at plus 300 volt. Plus. Plus. This should be plus, basically. But if we applied minus voltage, retarding voltage, the pulse length, pulse width, can be shortened. Hmm. But the scaling factor changes drastically. So if you operate uh, statistically, statistically uh, I need to put the bias voltage plus 300 or 500 volt. Okay. okay. Yeah. Thank you. If there are no more questions, then let's thank the speaker again. And we move to the next speaker, uh, Nicoleta Baboyev. Uh, Nicoleta studied uh, at the University of Bucharest in Romania, and he started to work at the Institute for Laser, Plasma, and Radiation Physics in Bucharest. Then he moved to Germany and did her PhD in Hamburg, and later moved to uh, Slack for a postdoc, and now is working at DESI. Her current activities are, in general, the flash diagnostics and the characterization of the BPMs. Today, she will report us about the beam position monitoring of multi-band electron beams at the flash FEL. So, thank you. Start. Yeah, so hello, everybody. I thank the organizer for choosing my contribution for an oral presentation. Today I will talk on beam position monitoring of multi-bunch electron beams at the flash-free electron laser. I will start my talk with, uh, with an introduction. Uh, I will give a brief overview of the flash facility. Then I will uh, introduce the beam position monitors at flash, and I will come to the scope of this paper. Then I will go to the second part of my talk, dealing with uh, beam position resolution along in long bunch trains for two types of BPMs, namely button and steep line BPMs. 
Then I will go to the third part dealing with a study on the BPM resolution versus a bunch offset, and I will end with a summary. FLASH, the free electron laser in Hamburg, produces long bunch trains, electron bunch trains, with help of a NAREF gun and lasers. Um, then the bunches are accelerated by uh, several Tesla superconducting accelerating modules. Um, and then are, are going to one of two undulator beam lines, flash one or flash two, where the FEL beam uh, is produced. Then the FEL beam goes to one of two experimental holes. I'm having trouble to point where I want to, to point. Then there is a third beam line which accommodates a laser plasma experiment named flash forward. Here are a few of uh, the parameters of the accelerator. The electron beam uh, energy is up to 1.25 GeV. The normalized emittance is of the order of 0 0.5 to 1 millimeter milliradian. Then the bunch charge in flash one is uh, typically between 0 0.1 to 1.2 nanocoulomb, slightly lower in flash two. And there are typically up to 5,000 bunches per second. Uh, the wavelength of the photon beam can be as low as 4.2 nanometer in flash one and slightly lower in flash two. Uh, the pulse duration uh, can be below 30 femtoseconds at full width half maximum and the energy uh, can go up to one millijoule. Uh, to 1,000 millijoule. Um, currently, there is a major upgrade of the facility. Um, for example, we increase the beam energy. The measurements I will show in this paper are uh, dealing, are made before the upgrade. There are many types of beam position monitors in the facility. There are uh, buttons, strip line, and cavity BPMs, each of them with several designs. So here I show a few examples. This is a button BPM. This is a strip line BPM. Actually, you see the end of a strip line BPM here, the four pickups. And here are two designs of cavity BPMs. Um, I put here also some references in case you are interested in them. And to give you an idea of uh, how many uh, and what type of BPMs we have in the facility. We have roughly 40 button BPMs of several designs, all using um, a readout which was designed for, for flash. There are about 35 strip line BPMs. Then there are uh, about 20 cavity BPMs uh, with an electronics design for the European XFEL. Then there are, after the, this shutdown, there are four so-called cold cavity BPMs in the superconducting modules. And there are also two so-called magnetic BPMs in the dumb lines. Now, for all these BPMs, we calculated the resolution uh, by using a method based on linear correlation among all the BPMs. Uh, from this linear correlation, we, we get a, a prediction for a certain BPM of interest, which together with the actual BPM reading gives us the RMS resolution. This is a typical, this is one example of a resolution measurement. This is for um, for the BPMs uh, along the um, for the flesh, measuring the flesh one bunch um, at, in this case, 0 0.4 nanocoulomb. This bunch passes a common beam line with a set of BPMs and then goes to the flesh one beam line. The lower plot shows the same for the flesh two bunch. We have here in red uh, marked the pattern BPMs, which I remember you are very different designs. In blue are strip line BPMs, and in green are cavity BPMs. So you can see that they are, most of them are below uh, five micrometer for this charge. 
Um, maybe you notice here that there, are, there is a one button BPM which is clearly above it. This is a, a different design which is for a larger beam pipe. So here I give an overview of the resolutions measured for different kinds of BPMs and for different charges. So button BPMs uh, usually um, measure, the, measure charges between 20 picocoulomb and 1 nanocoulomb with a resolution of 3 to 100 micrometer, depending on the charge and on the type. Then there are steep line BPMs, um, which can measure lower charges and have a resolution between 2 and 15 uh, micrometer. Cavity BPMs uh, have also measure from 10 picocoulomb charge and have a resolution of 1 to 3 micrometer. And the cold cavity BPM, they need a higher charge. They are of all type, and they also have a, a higher value for the resolution. Now, um, while the resolution of the first bunch or signal bunch has been analyzed many times before, uh, we typically accelerate bunch trains. Actually, there are two bunch trains, one for, one for flash one, one for flash two with a repetition frequency of 10 hertz. The bunch repetition frequency is between 50 and 1,000 kilohertz. And the BPMs in the facility have to measure each of these bunches. So we did an analysis for all the bunches in, uh, in uh, bunch trains by using the same method as I described before. Um, we did this analysis, this measurement for a flash one bunch train where we have button and strip line BPMs mainly. Now, here is a result. So we took 200 bunch trains, data from 200 bunch trains um, with a charge of 0 0.2 to 0 0.4 nanocoulomb per bunch. We had various bunch frequencies between 50 and uh, 1,000 kilohertz. The upper plots show the average measurement of this uh, uh, 200 pulses for each bunch in the bunch train. So this is uh, the horizontal axis is time, or it, it's approximately the same with the bunch. The middle plot shows the standard deviation for each bunch, and the lower plots the resolution. Um, there are various uh, colors for each uh, bunch frequency. The left uh, set uh, shows uh, results for a button BPM, the right one for strip line BPM with 34 millimeter diameter in each case. You notice here that the behavior is kind of similar for both, so let's look in more detail for, at, the strip line, at the strip line BPM. You notice that in our measurements, the bunch offset was uh, different for each bunch frequency. This came already for the laser. We observed this already for the first BPM. You also notice that the bunch offset changes along the bunch train. And uh, what I found interesting is that also the standard deviation changes along the bunch train. So while we, we don't really know the reason for that, we notice that for, from the first BPMs. And um, we also investigated the, um, um, the charge measurement from a current monitor. You see here the bunch charge, the average bunch charge reading uh, for the various frequencies. And you see that the charge has, has changed. Otherwise, it's quite constant along the bunch train apart from the first, maybe the first bunch, uh, bunches in the train. The standard deviation has some oscillation. Um, on average, is constant. These oscillations cannot be uh, recognized in the behavior of the BPM standard deviation. In both, both uh, cases, I find interesting that the resolution stays constant, and, and it's the same for each bunch frequency. Um, okay. Now, we, we wonder what happened, what, 
well, because in Flash 1, we only had these two types of BPMs, which uses the same electronics. So you wonder what is the uh, um, display of another kind of BPM, and we have another kind only in Flash 2. Um, here I, I, I found the data set for 53 bunches for Flash 2, and uh, the frequency of 100 kilohertz and a bunch charge of 0.1 anucoulomb. These are four BPMs uh, along the beam line which show kind of similar behavior. And then we chose also two cavity BPMs, which have, they have not, not only another principle, another design, but also have a different electronics designed by, um, for the XFEL. And you see that they also show a, div, um, a change in the offset along the bunch train. So, that's as far as we can say about this behavior. This has to be further investigated. Now I come to the third part of my talk, which is uh, dependency of the resolution versus the bunch offset. We uh, varied the, um, the beam offset uh, in the XY plane. And um, here you see the measurement at three strip line BPMs. And for each beam position, we, we uh, evaluated the resolution. And you see here the resolution versus the bunch offset. And uh, for a range of roughly plus minus four millimeter, you see that the resolution stays basically below four micrometer. For a charge, uh, we you see a charge of 0 0.4 nanocoulomb. This brings me to to the summary of my talk, so there are many types of BPMs in flash, and we give here results for button and strip line BPMs, which typically have, strip line BPMs have a typical resolution of two to 15 micrometer for charges between uh, 10 picocoulomb and one nanocoulomb. Button BPMs have a resolution of three to 100 micrometer RMS for charges of 20 picocoulomb and one nanocoulomb. We uh, analyzed the behavior in long bunch trains, and we saw some uh, offset change along the train, and also of the standard deviation, and the behavior has to be uh, further study. And, uh, but uh, however, the resolution of single bunch remains constant on the bunch train. Also, we studied the dependency of the resolution for um, strip line BPMs along, uh, versus offset, and we found that uh, it's uh, constant, basically constant in a range of uh, plus minus four millimeter. I want to acknowledge that uh, this work is a result of uh, the direct or indirect work of uh, many colleagues, and also the operation groups uh, has uh, been of great help in doing the measurements. So I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Nicoletta, for the talk. Um, are there any questions in the room? Okay, here, this one. So it's interesting that the standard deviation increases along the bunch train. Do the downstream users see any uh, evidence of bunch jitter increasing with time in the bunch train? Well, I am not aware of such measurements, uh, so I don't know. But uh, as an operator in the control room, it looks like the, um, the photon BPMs don't show uh, larger jitter, at least as you see by eye, say. And do the beam dynamics people think there are some mechanisms for bunch to bunch jitter along the train, beam loading, wake fields? So I don't think that anyone analyzed this. I mean, we, were, we, we only were aware until now about, uh, about the changes in the offset along the bunch train, which was of not big um, interest so far to put effort into this to, to, to find the reason. Although there is interest, but uh, there was always other priorities. But maybe after these results, we can put more effort into that yeah, when, uh, when I possible. Yeah, I hope you investigate it further. It's interesting. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. 
in any case, we want to investigate further. Yeah. Okay, I don't see more questions. I have one. Um, have you studied uh, if there is a dependence on the bunch uh, density, let's say, on the peak charge or on the beam size or something like this? If you change the beta functions or something along the, the mm. line? I think the beam size is difficult to measure f for each bunch. Maybe one can do a study with a gated camera, but uh, I'm not aware of having such a measurement yet. Right. And the bunch density, no, I didn't look into that. Of course, uh, the, the photon people see something else than what I see. I see the center of mass, and they see the FEL beam emitted by some part of the bunch. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that would be interesting, but it's a more effort to put into yeah. it, yeah. OK. If there are no more questions, uh, then let's thank the speaker again. Um, before uh, finishing the session, let me remind you that uh, you all have to sign uh, the paper on the reception desk if you want to go to the conference dinner. And like this, we close the session and the uh, day one of IVIC. Thank you. <laughs>